Purple Daily is daily Vikings entertainment. Do you just want the Vikings to win a Super Bowl before we die? I will ride with this group. Seriously, man. Please. And away we go. Okay, this is this is our trade deadline recap episode. Do we have cricket cricket noises we can play? Should have loaded those on the button mark. But we'll di- we'll discuss here whether the Vikings. I mean, Cam Robinson. They they broke early, right? They got Cam Robinson. He helped them win a game, yeah. but they didn't make another splash. Was that problematic? Was it prudent? We will discuss here on Purple Daily. Uh, hey, Park Dental. Let's talk about Park Dental here, okay? You want to talk about? Making a great trade. Not really a trade, I guess. My old dentist retired. And so I was actually a free agent. You put him on waivers. Well, he kind of waved. Did he wave me? I don't know. Yep. Yep. He bailed on you. I don't know, man. But uh, I I was a free agent. I found a new dentist, Park Dental, which, by the way, has been serving people's teeth and mouths over 50 years (laughs) in Minnesota and western Wisconsin. And uh, if you're like me and you're looking for a new great experience, maybe you are maybe you are a dentist drifter and you just you're just looking for a new place to latch on to. I am very happy that I well, was recommended Park Dental. Schedule your checkup at parkdental.com, parkdental.com. So the Vikings did not add a defensive tackle. They did not add a cornerback. Cam Robinson and Cam Akers, by the way, who had a nice little game. Second time they traded for him, uh, but but the second the second splash did not happen. Are you disappointed in the Vikings, you guys? I am personally not, and here's why. Um, so for, first of all, they deserve full credit, despite the fact it happened a week before the deadline. Officially, to what you were just saying, Phil, the Cam Robinson trade, the addressing of a position where you lost a a guy that was going to be and and hopefully will be at some point in time a Pro Bowl player in Christian. Darisaw. And you're like, okay, we've won at that point in time five games. But we're proposing that we move Blake Brandle to left tackle, which would weaken that spot. We'll bring Reisner in and play him at left guard. And then Quazy and his staff come along and say, hold on a second here. We're going to essentially send a fifth round that might be a, a fourth round pick. And by the way, we're getting a pick back as well for a starting caliber. He's not Darisaw. Few are. But we're going to get a guy that can step in and play immediately. You deserve a lot of credit. Like the Acres thing is nice depth, and I like him. But I think that was more of an O'Connell thing, right? Like I really like Acres. He knows he knows what I want. Clearly, Ty Chandler does not. The Robinson thing was you got five wins. You don't have to give them back. But it's cer- it's certainly going to be tougher if we don't have a starting caliber left tackle. So point one is they do get a lot of credit. That's a that is akin to basically it is a trade deadline acquisition. The other thing is if you look at the names that were on the move yesterday and there were a bunch of trades and there were a bunch of names that you recognized, some are aging, um, but there was only one that I thought from a cornerback discussion that I thought, oh man, that's a nice pickup. That was Washington uh, getting Marshawn Lattimore from the Saints. Yeah. Okay. That was a nice pickup. He is, I think, 29, but he is still a pretty damn good player. Washington, which is very much in the playoff hunt, uh, but could use some strengthening, made a nice trade. But let's go through the terms of, of that trade, okay? And this is where not having draft capital left just hurts you. But the terms of that trade were the Saints got back a third, fourth, and a sixth round pick, and they in turn sent Lattimore and a fifth round pick to the Commanders. And... The only uh, the only defensive tackle that was moved on deadline day was a gentleman by the name of Khalil Davis, who was traded for a seventh round pick uh, to San Francisco by Houston. Strictly a rotational guy. The Vikings weren't in the market for rotational guys. Like like it's not like they were saying, "Can we just add a corner? I don't care who. We're we're low on depth there. They're not low on depth there. Can we just add a defensive tackle? No. They were looking to make a splash move. I think. One is when it came to, and it was fun to to talk about, and we will be back here next year doing the same thing. I will not back off, but when we recklessly speculate, right? Dexter Lawrence, Jeffrey Simmons, great names. They weren't traded. And quite frankly, the Vikings didn't have the assets unless they were going to give up their first round picks to trade for those guys. So as much fun as it was to talk about the the prospect of a big deal coming together on Tuesday, 
I think the reality is we saw that if you wanted to make that splash trade, you had to have more picks. And the Vikings have made a, a lot of trades with picks, but I personally don't mind those trades. So I actually give them credit for Robinson and on the rest of it say, it would have been fun. It would be, be great, but you only had three 2025 picks. So you sort of were stuck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually applaud them. It, it stinks you lost Derisaw because if you didn't lose Derisaw, I do think they buy something, but they obviously forced themselves to have to do something because they just did not feel comfortable with their internal options at left tackle. And I kind of like that they just went out and got something, what, six days before the deadline ended instead of being desperate buyers. I mean, like, if they had approached Jacksonville about Cam Robinson leading up to yesterday's deadline, like, does that price go up? I I think it goes up. If And then, and they did bench him, but, like, I think the price would have went would have been a lot more expensive for Cam Robinson yesterday than it was a week ago. And they get they they fixed that position. They're playing with house money this season. They're six and two. Could they use a defensive tackle? Of course they could. But I, I the arrow is still clearly pointed at 25 and 26 as the real years of if we want to be buyers, those are the years that we have to use future assets. I think using future assets in 2024 due to the state of this team would have been not the wisest move to do. So I kind of like that they, when they did the Robinson trade, the timing of it was perfect and not getting fleeced into, you know, paying more for something that might hurt you in the long run. Uh, if they would have done it a, a deadline deal yesterday. Where, yeah. Where I'm at with this is it feels like they, they, they're really on thin ice with how much draft capital has eroded in 2025, 26. I'm fine with the erosion. Cause I, th they've taken away from, some of those mid round, right? But they also like they don't have a second round pick next year, third round. So they've they've taken away from day two and day three of the next two drafts to go move up the board for uh, JJ McCarthy, Dallas Turner positioning for a Cam Robinson trade here uh, to make sure that you fortify in a season in which you think you might be the second best team in the conference. You can't just quit and wave the white flag. These chances don't come around too often. So I'm fine with the moves they've made up until this point. But if the question was, what more draft capital would you give up yesterday or two days ago? And what would that player have to be? I still think Dexter Lawrence is like the only like true needle-moving player that could get you to a Super Bowl this year. You, By the way, you might get there. Hell, like if you can beat the Lions... Once in January, not the first time they play, which is week 18, but like the third time they would they would they would play. Sure. Um, you might be able to get there without Dexter Lawrence. But I think you let this thing ride. It's all kind of house money. Nobody thought you were going to be in this position. Even if you finish 500 ish the rest of the way, you're going to win double digit games. You're going to get to the playoffs like play with your house money and then hammer your cap space and however you need to use your first and two fifths. And then in 2026, the other thing is like they have a first, second, third. They don't have either a fourth or a fifth. I don't think they have a sixth because that's part of the, uh, well, there's a Rams conditional trade and then a Texans conditional trade. It's so like that draft capital is eroding, right. but do what you can this year and then take your 70 plus million dollars in cap space, go to the market there's some big names out there that we can talk about here too. Uh, and then decide, are we using the first round picks in 25 and 26 for young players on rookie scale deals? Or are we going full Rams with those first round picks to add to a really good roster? And if you look to, I don't think any of the names of the players that moved on Tuesday were names that that were talked about in connection. So it's not like it's not like oh man, Dexter Lawrence got traded and you just came up short, right? Yeah. Oh, like, it was only it was a first and a third. Like what happened there? Yeah. My, my sense of things, just from a guessing perspective, and, and it makes a lot of sense, is that if the Vikings were going to make a trade on Tuesday, they went big game hunting, and none of those guys got dealt. Yeah. So I'm fine with this. I I don't think that there is. I think as far as Quasi goes, again, I'll go back to what we talked about, I think, on Purple Daily on uh, on Tuesday. There's a lot of drafting things to quibble about. I think pro personnel-wise, he's done just fine. He's done well, I think. 
I really do. He's brought in players. Mm -hmm. They've signed the, the free agent class, as I declared, and I, I think it, it continues to stand up as the best full free agent class this franchise has ever signed. Yeah. If, you know, if you look at bringing in a guy immediately for Derisaw, upgrading from Chandler to Akers, I think quibbling with his pro personnel moves is fairly difficult. Yeah. So he, just can we look ahead, actually? Can we? Can we? Because... Like this season's gonna play out however it is, yeah. but but how are they gonna let's let's have a bigger picture discussion about if they have shoved the window open now. Yeah, this, and this is to, this is Jacksonville championship week. I just want to I know, remind I, you of I that. know. I mean I'm very focused. And then it's on the Titans Jags. championship week. Yeah, I've got that. all my notes let's, on Let's the just Jags. do that for one football team. We're not doing that for this football team. Can I, <laughs> can I make an executive decision? I know I I know I'm the St. Cloud State graduate here. I didn't go yeah, to U of you M. Drop can, football. We just, can we just yeah, we just sorry. That we're gophers. St. Cloud football. State, you can't talk about college football if uh, your school no. didn't have college football. No. So that's going to devastate Declan, I know. Um, but <laughs> let, let's have let's have a big picture. Let's let's overlook the Jaguars for a second here. Okay, sorry to jinx this game this weekend. How do you make the current Vikings a level or two better to put them on? The, I mean, the the Lions started building their thing basically th two seats. Three seasons ago, right? It was the 2022 season where they started like one and six or whatever it was. And by the end of the year, they're beating the Green Bay Packers to get to nine wins. They're, they won almost every game in November and December. They were a freight train. They continued it in 2023. I feel like the Vikings are kind of in that 2022 Lions where, okay, you're they started hotter than the Lions did, but they're on to something maybe a year early. They're building a culture. How do you add to it? And I think my... Biggest question is, how are they going to get an interior defensive lineman, a defensive tackle, somebody who can sit in there next to Harrison Phillips and wreak havoc in the run game, in the pass game? The Vikings have been terrible when it comes to, like, up-the-middle pressure mm -hmm. when they're not blitzing. Like, they can generate it through blitzes. So, a few weeks ago, PFF put out their top 50 projected free agents for 2025. Because, again, the Vikings have, like, the sixth most cap space. Music to my ears. There's only one defensive tackle on this list, and it's uh, it's McNeil from Detroit. The twenty, he's like a 25 year old kid. Former is it pronounced Aleem McNeil? He was a third round draft pick in 2021. I mean, Aiden Hutchinson gets all the headlines on that defensive line, right? But uh, six foot two, 315 pounds. He's been in terms of like interior pressure rates. Nah, we're not talking like Dexter Lawrence, you know, Aaron Donald levels, but really good pressure, really good run defender. He is a free agent who will be 25 years old. Actually, he doesn't even turn 25 until May. So he'll still be, he'll be 24 years old hitting the market in free agency. That's the only interior defensive lineman of note in the top 50 free agents. Now there's a handful of cornerbacks like, the DJ Reeds of the world, but how are you? If if are you gonna are you gonna win the bidding for that one? Like, there's gonna be a bunch of teams looking to give him twenty plus million dollars a year, just, right? Yeah. yeah. Does he want to go back to Detroit? Right. Or do you have to earmark that first round pick to say either we're going to trade it for someone, or we're we're stuck committed to drafting someone to fill that position in the first round? That is my biggest question. If you can put a, an absolute stud at that position. Right. I think it gets your well, defense to a new level. And then if J.J. McCarthy can play, like, okay, now we're talking the next three years. Yeah, and that that also begins a conversation, too, about the fact if you look at the defensive components, some of them are just flat out old. Like, your corners your corners could all be, be gone. Um, they're all signed, if I'm not mistaken, or in the last year of their contract. So, And Murphy, the question there is, are you going to pay him a lot to, to come back? Um, I would assume that Gilmore might retire, mm -hmm. um, and and he is. I, I mean, he is, and he's done a pretty damn good job. But he is the the uh, definition of a football mercenary. Um, Shaq Griffin probably leaves. So there is a lot to think about as far as how you're going to construct and fill positions, especially I think on defense. So are, are you going to draft a defensive tackle for first round? I mean. Dex has been floating out for a long time, and he, he might be right that they'll probably try and trade back because they need to get more draft picks. Like, that's not being cute now. That's simply saying we, we need to accrue more picks. 
there are a lot of well, and this is this is where we we are going to have a conversation to to go down your path here, Phil. We're going to have a conversation about the drafting philosophy as well. Like that's if, going. If Quasi is drafting again, like if 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 he's yeah. back, and I think he's back, but no, I think I agree. He's back, like the free agent class. Yeah, I was just back. But if he's in charge of the draft, how much do you have to consider the fact that these have been largely dud? Dra- I mean, we'll see on a couple of these players from this right. last class. Like, would would you be better off trading first round picks for twenty six year old stud players like Dexter Lawrence? I mean, that's the question. Here's the so here's my feeling about that is if that's occasionally to fill a spot, like okay, we are good, like right now, right? This team is good. Bang, let's try to make an mm-hmm. impact move. Then I'm fine with it. But you also can't just like punt on the draft in perpetuity. And he, what we don't know though, because Quasi is an analytics guy who takes a lot of advice and watches film. I'm not saying he doesn't. I'm not trying to insult him, okay? But he's not Rick Spielman. He's not your football guy who's drafting. Mm -hmm. He's not going into the draft room with a cigar and a notebook full of, he saw a bunch of college players. I would love to know what the Vikings' real process is. Like, how did we get here as far as the draft goes? You know, I, I, sorry, call me a cynic, but I'm hard-pressed to believe that Quasi identified scene like that came from, did that come from Donatel? Did that come from the scouting staff? Like, I think Quasi wanted to trade back and they said, okay, here's your best option. But do I think that he's really pulling the trigger on player after player? I don't know about that. The philosophy of trading back definitely might be, be him. But I think there's a bigger discussion about how that room works because, yeah, you cannot have this. Well, we just don't draft well. Like that's that will get you in a huge amount of trouble yeah. eventually. Yeah, no, I, I, I do agree with that. And also, if you have in terms of offseason assets, you have cap space and a first round pick and then a 2026 first round pick. Ideally, you would deploy all of those sort of separately. So you go spend cap space on stud players here and use first round pick to either draft a player or trade for a separate player. I think you get into some trouble though if you trade first round picks for players that already make $25 million yeah. and now you're filling cap space with with a player that you had to use a first round asset to acquire. Like if you could go sign this 25 year old uh, McNeil from Detroit in free agency for 20 or 25 million, whatever it is, $27 million. Yep. And have a first round pick to go get a cornerback or something. Correct. That's a better use of assets. But on the draft, it's not, dude, it's not just the Quasi era. I saw this. <laughs> You're right. This is crazy. In fact, I'm going to throw it at you guys in just a moment here after Judd gives us an update on his uh, Livia tune up. Oh, most definitely. It's going well. 15 pounds down. I uh, j- joined up for a tune-up about a month and a half ago or so. You know, I just gained some pounds back. What Got back on the program, dropped 15 pounds. I'm going to tell you right now, Livia Weight Control Center uh, works because it's supportive, because it's an easy program to follow, and because they are going to help you shed weight. In fact, first eight weeks are free if you sign up now. And this plan is going to change on Saturday. So take advantage because in your first eight weeks, you can lose up to 20 pounds. The The nutrition plan is fantastic. There are also are medical options as well. Livia is really the place to go to lose weight. L-I-V-E-A.com, 855-GO-L-I-V-E-A. Livia.com will help you drop those unwanted pounds so you don't gain even more weight during the winter. Also, Nicolay Law, shout out to the exclusive personal injury law firm of Purple Daily. Nicolay Law knows that when you or a loved one gets injured, ordinary life can come to a stop. Things can get complicated. And that's where they come in to help make sure you get the compensation you deserve after an accident. So uh, if you've been injured, you or a family member, get Minnesota's local award-winning injury lawyers. Get Nicolay. Start your path to winning at NicolayLaw.com or give them a call at 1-855-NICOLAY. All right, this is crazy. I saw this. It is. (laughs) This is from the Pickenum, P-I-C-K-I-N-E-M Instagram account. We'll trust their research on this. <laughs> Each team's percentage of draft picks that never play in the NFL over the last 10 years, not counting 2024. So the last 10 years, back to 2015, not counting 2024. 
the Chiefs lead the league by a mile. Only 1.5% of Chiefs draft picks don't play in the NFL. So I'm, I'm guessing that's like one. One out of the 75 or something that they've drafted, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the the uh, well, the Broncos are almost double that at two point seven percent, and then Giants are three percent all the way up. Dead last on this list, yeah. The Minnesota Vikings, the last ten years, thirteen point two percent of Vikings draft picks never play a snap in the NFL. Remarkable. I mean, and that's not just a quasi thing. Obviously, that's Rick Spielman era kind of bleeding in there too right so is that when you see that the last 10 years the chiefs only have one percent of drafted players never play a snap just like let's find we'll find a way to use all of these guys in some capacity right and the vikings are sitting there at 13 percent is that bad scouting is it bad drafting or is it hey the chiefs coaching staff can just find a way to make it work this guy might not be what we thought but here's the role for him. And the Vikings are just not creative in that way. So it goes back to Spielman and Zimmer, but let's go through this um, because I think the Spielman and Zimmer issue was process, and here's why. Rick's philosophy, and as we know, they stopped talking. Married yeah. couples, stop talking, don't go to counseling, usually get divorced. Um, and if you look at what the process was then, starting, you know, so what, 2014-ish, was, you know, Rick's philosophy was I want to trade back and accrue picks because I scout talent. I'm going to find talent, Uh, you know, bleep that pick, you know, at 22 in the third round. I'm going to move back and get all these fifth rounders. Mm -hmm. Well, we all know that Mike had no patience. And so, and, and, and the fact that Mike walked out when they took Kellen Mond, walked out of the draft room, as Mike told Mark Craig, I left the draft, okay? That shows you how far away the philosophy that Rick was applying went to what Mike wanted. Mm-hmm. So I think I think it's a very simple explanation, unfortunately. And there's blame to go around here. I'm not going to absolve Rick by any means. But, you know, Rick wanted to trade back, wanted to take as many picks as possible. Mike's like, you're not taking as good of players. I can't play them. I don't trust them. I think in the Quasi O'Connell thing, it's more there's more of a discussion about because, one – the draft so far, it's not a ton of them. So, so the sample size is not nearly as big, but I, you know, Kevin is not an impatient guy. I mean, Kevin's not, Kevin's not purposely going to sit guys out of almost spite at times. Um, But the draft had, and this is where I'd like to know how the draft process now works because again, I will say this Quasi Dolph Mensa does not come in with a binder on draft night. <laughs> Saying these are my guys, yeah. right? And the other, I've watched. I've watched every snap yeah. of. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And the other interesting thing is, if you look at his drafts, three of them now, correct? Mm-hmm. If you look at his drafts, they have been very different. The first one was the Spielman esque. I'll trade back and outsmart the system, and then it didn't work at all. It's been a disaster. Yeah. So then the next one was, I might trade back from the pick. O'Connell's like, don't trade back from the pick. They take a receiver who's pretty good. In, in the first round. But then this last draft was very much the, when Childress had the final call and, you know, the Jared Allen trade, I think the Vikings had like four or five picks tops. So I, I'm much harder pressed to explain what their philosophy is and where, where it's going and who is, like if there was a fly in the ointment, what I would love to know is what is it exactly? I feel like it's easy to say it's all crazy and he is the ultimate guy at the end of the day, yeah. but I but I am far more confused. I am far more ponderous about what exactly is transpiring that's leading to this. This is though, like if I can play devil's advocate for the Vikings' sake, and just the teams, the bottom of this list, like and the bottom four teams, these teams have either been in cha- conference championships or been to Super Bowls. The Niners are twenty fifth on this list. The Bengals are 29th on this list. The Packers are 26th on this list. The Patriots are 31st, but they did have Tom Brady for a good chunk of that. The Buccaneers are 23rd. The common denominator, though, is all those teams had either drafted a stud quarterback 
either in with Joe Burrow and the Bengals, or they luck into one in Brock Purdy with San Francisco. Or, like, it's just random. Like, that, that that's where, like, the draft sometimes to me, like, yes, you can't just completely be missing on picks forever. Like, that that's, that's totally true. But if you can nail a good quarterback, and the Vikings have identified J.J. McCarthy as the franchise QB, you can have bad drafts for nine years and still be in the conference conference championship game for multiple seasons. So, like, it, it, it is an alarming stat, but when I look at, like, I don't know, the Giants being third on this list, had the Giants ever been considered legitimate Super Bowl contenders since 2015? No. So, yeah, there's, there's nuance and context, 100%. And you could also have stubborn organizations that are like, we we will play our draft picks no matter what because damn it we drafted them. Uh, I'll, let me add, let me throw this back at you guys in a different context. If you just go back, this is how frustrating it can be when you look back and see where the Vikings are at right now. But there's like a level between them and the Lions, and how do you get there? And you go back to the 2022 draft, and you guys probably saw the headline earlier this week that Andrew Booth was cut by the Cowboys, so he's now been jettisoned by. His second team before turning 25. How old is he? Lewis Seen, obviously, we've talked a lot about him. Uh, Brian Asamoa, there were some headlines, third round pick headlines that the Vikings were shopping him before the trade deadline. Mm -hmm. Man, like, what if even, I mean, hell, what if all of those dudes turned out to be studs or you drafted somebody else? What if you just replaced Lewis Seen with Kyle Hamilton? How would you feel about the next three year window? But, like, what if Andrew Booth, if you could just wave a magic wand and say, Andrew Booth is a stud. They nailed that pick, and he is a starting cornerback, a high-end starting cornerback in the NFL. Right. And Makai Blackman's coming back next year off the injury. But instead of having literally zero reliable cornerbacks under contract in 2024 or 25, you would have two now, Blackman's under contract, so I'm kind of playing both sides of that fence there. But, like, man, like, you look back and say, it's, we're not even talking about the whole, like, give us, flip one of those right. guys. It's like the the electoral, right? Just flip, if you flip that state, <laughs> if you just flip Andrew Booth or you just flip, you know, I mean, even Ed Ingram. We're sitting right. here and we're wondering, like, you know, he was okay this weekend. But what if you just had a freaking, just a badass bona fide top five right guard for the next handful of years. Right. Um, how would you feel it, that that a player or two of that caliber that you whiffed on could be the difference between you and the Lions? And I feel like the while it's certainly true in some ways, the draft is random thing also is a cover for those who fail. Because when you take Garrett Bradbury, who's a center in the first round, where, by the way, that's just a bad idea, like you're causing yourself more problems. So it's yeah. like that first round center better hit, you know, when, when you take, when, when you trade way back to the end of the first round and end up with a guy who's, who wasn't probably in retrospect, even worthy of a seventh round pick, that's not random. That's just stupidity. Mm -hmm. So like, that's the, they, like they're, Dex is right. Like there's a conversation here. I feel, I feel like there's a lot of people on one side of the fence. The draft is random. What are you going to do? And then there's no, they're screwing up, but. So like what Phil just said, there's also this place right in the sweet spot in the middle where it's like, okay, but why did everyone in that draft class essentially yeah. fail? You know, because yeah. you can't afford, you can't afford that. That's, that's death. Yeah. And without a doubt, like, look at what the Lions did with those first four picks in the 2023 class, where it's Jameer Gibbs, who right now is like leading the league in yards per attempt. Jack yeah. Campbell's a good linebacker for them. Sam Laporte is a good tight end. Brian Branch is an awesome defensive oh, back. That's like, a draft. They, they literally, and, and by the way, they got all four of those guys in the first 45 picks of the draft. Funny enough, both of them, or four of them, just from two schools. Obviously, Campbell, Laporta being Iowa guys, Branch and Gibbs were Bama guys. But even, and, and I'm not trying to completely contradict myself with the randomness, but you even look at 2022, the Lions get Hutchinson, Jamison Williams, who when he plays, he's pretty solid, but he also keeps sabotaging himself. Uh, Kirby Joseph was a third round pick for them. So... How much of that is legitimate? Hey, the Lions have done a really good job with these high-end draft classes of, of identifying stud players. And how much of that is like, can you continue to do that year after year where no. you're coming away with this every well, in the they, first three rounds with studs after stud after stud? They won't. They've done a brilliant job, but there is a luck factor. They won't be able to replicate that probably. 
year after year, but they don't have to because now their window is yeah. wide open. Yeah, maybe it'd be nice to. But when you hit when you hit like two or three draft classes in a row like that, right? It really needs to align with all right. You got the right coach in place. You got a quarterback that can sling it, and they have all those things. And it, it's position too, right? Like D- Detroit now is going to be drafting typically very late, which is going to hurt them. But they're but they got there through doing the right things when they had the pick. So and yeah. yeah, that's the thing is it depends where the picks are. It's why I'm not a big fan of trading back consistently because I do think that yes, you get more players, but the question is, are you passing up a quality, you know, for instance, Kyle Hamilton, you know, you got more draft picks to get more players, but you passed up a potential Pro Bowl safety. And there's just a lot this is a very I think nuanced conversation. Like it's very in depth about how you Mm. get there, what you're doing, what your process is. And I think the chief's thing is, I do think the chief's thing is instructive because what that says to me is you do have a pro personnel department or a personnel department for college scouting and GM that's working very closely with the coaching staff to identify the right guys. Yeah. Like Zimmer and Spielman by the end for a long time, it felt like post Kirk, right? We're oil and water. So you literally had one guy drafting saying, this is what I want to do. And you literally had a coach saying. Mocking that guy and walking out of the freaking yes, room. So, right. Yeah. You can't like that is that. And, and I think uh, I think Quasi and, and O'Connell are on the same page. So I'm not trying to insinuate okay. that's the problem now. But like when that happens, when you just go ro- or sort of go rogue and take Mond and the coach is like, well, then I'm out of here. Yeah. You got no chance. I mean, if you're drafting like a sixth round quarterback and your coach is like, ah, I think he kind of sucks. It's, it's just just put him just put him out there, you know, as as right. the scout team. A third round right. asset on a quarterback that your coach laughs at is I know we're like relitigating a lot of uh right, but, but Vikings these history problems. here, but yeah. So these are the issues. But they're still but man, they're still they're sitting here, they're set up, they they do have a first round pick in the next yeah. two drafts. They've got a ton of cap space. Um, they're, they're, they're set up very, very nicely yes. if they can pull the right levers and, but they, it is imperative with this window open now that they nail the first round picks in the next two years, either via great trades or by selecting the right players to jump right in and fit this thing, just like the lions did. And I'm not sure about you guys, but I've much preferred this draft, not just because of the McCarthy pick. But I'd much prefer that you take draft assets and move up to get a player that you really like than drop back and skip on on a player. Like, I think that Dallas Turner is going to be good. Mm -hmm. And I'd far prefer that, and they were, that they were aggressive. I I mean, it's the anti-scene pick, right? Mm -hmm. Because in this case, they're like, let's go back. Let's let's package some picks with the first rounder that we got from Houston to grab a defensive guy that we think is really good and is falling. So if you ask me, would you prefer just to get more picks and take some chances or you've identified a guy that you like and my God, surprisingly, he's still available and it's going to cost you some draft capital. I'll take door two. Yeah. Yep. So, all right. That's our, that that's our trade deadline recap episode that turned into a big picture state yeah. of the state of the window episode here. Purple daily. I think we're all bullish on what they're doing, yeah. but there are, certainly are some questions about like, where are you going to improve? some things but you know the pro personnel stuff is important and and i really feel like they have continually hit home runs with the new administration in free agency in trades you know the the hawkinson trade still a hell of a trade yeah and you resigned him so you're sitting you're sitting on one of the best five best pass catching tight ends in the league um who who made his debut so yeah all right, boys. Uh, Judd, you're going to go out to Vikings practice, so we'll we'll sprinkle in Judd's practice notes, press conference notes on Thursday tomorrow. Thursday feedback oh, he'll Friday. Be happy. They kept all the picks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we can we can talk about this statistic that we talked about here too with him and get his thoughts. Uh, and then yeah, don't forget join us at Park Tavern on Sunday for a live watch party and a live Vikings event line. Park Tavern in St. Louis Park, Minnesota, Jacksonville. <laughs> Mm. Sunday, we'll we'll probably get there around 11 a.m. We Minnesota. just want the Vikings to win a Super Bowl before we die.